Good evening. I'm Eric Isaacs. Uh, welcome to Carnegie. I'm Eric Isaacs, the president of the Carnegie Institution for Science. And uh, it's my real pleasure tonight to uh, welcome our speaker, Christine McDivitt Tompkins. Uh, she's an adventurer, a leader, and a visionary. She was born and raised on a ranch in Southern California. And she was only 15 years old when she began working for Yvonne and Melinda Chouinard, who founded the Patagonia Company. She became the company's CEO uh, when she was barely out of college. And with her leadership, Patagonia grew into one of the largest producers of outdoor equipment in the world. Patagonia also became, very importantly, a model of corporate responsibility, mitigating its own environmental impacts and educating its customers about threats to the ecology and to our planet. After 20 years as Patagonia's CEO, Christine retired and married Doug Tompkins, a successful entrepreneur and ardent conservationist. And when she married, she moved with her husband to South Chile. Together they founded the Tompkins Conservation and began working with the governments of Chile and Argentina to create national parks and protect ecologically important areas. Tompkins Conservation's most ambitious project was launched about three years ago when Christine and her husband proposed a deal to the government of Chile. They would donate more than one million acres of land, the largest donation of private land in history, if the Chilean government committed additional lands to create new national parks in Patagonia. Not long after they made this ambitious proposal, uh, Doug Tompkins died of a, after a kayaking accident. And despite her loss, Christine Tompkins stayed focused on the creation of this new parkland. The Tompkins vision was finally realized in January of this past year when the president of Chile announced that the government would contribute 9 million acres of their own to the effort, creating five new national parks and expanding an additional three. Through the Tompkins efforts, an area almost as large as Switzerland has been protected from bulldozers and a chain of national parks now stretches down the southern half of Chile to Cape Horn. The Tompkins conservation contributions go far beyond a transfer of land from private hands to public ownership. They work with biologists to introduce missing species and restore damaged ecologies, a process they're calling rewilding, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that tonight. In the Ibera marshlands of northern Argentina, for example, they successfully return giant anteaters, pampas deer, tapirs, and green-winged macaws. Just this past summer, the rewilding efforts were awarded by the birth of two jaguar cubs in, Iber in the Ibera Park. These were the first jaguars born in the region since the industrialization of the 20th century. Christine Tompkins has received international recognition for her unwavering commitment to conservation of wilderness in Chile and in Argentina. And last year, she received the Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy, which is bestowed by the Carnegie family of institutions, including ours, Carnegie Science, uh, to philanthropists whose work reflect Andrew Carnegie's philosophy of giving for the good of the people. And early this year, Christine was designated an environmental patron of protected areas by the United Nations. In a recent op-ed in, in the Washington Post, Christine Tompkins posed a deeply profound question. Can we create a durable civilization in which humans become good neighbors in the community of life, where our society is embedded in a matrix of wild nature that allows all creatures, from microorganisms to blue whales, freedom to pursue happiness and raise their progeny in a secure habitat. Through her work to create national parks and restore biodiversity to wilderness lands, Ms. Tompkins is answering that question and making her vision of a durable and biological den and making Christine McDivick Tompkins. Good evening, everybody. Um, along with two colleagues, two and a half, <laughs> who are with me tonight, uh, thank you very much for welcoming wildlife and um, uh, wild landscapes into your home. I'm going to take you on a, on a trip tonight through the southern cone uh, of Argentina and Chile, and we're going to dogleg up into the northeastern section of Argentina to show you three different landscape types 
that we have been working on for the last 26 years. The first one in the rain, temperate rainforests of southern Chile. The second one, the vast grasslands of the Patagonia steppe. And then finally up into the Ibera wetlands where you will see one of our biggest rewilding projects that we have ever begun. I'm going to start by giving you a little background of my husband and me and how did we end up doing what we've been doing and what, what are for us the root causes of the, the, the degradation in some areas, the full collapse of ecosystems around the world and what our response has been um, at least as, as a foundation and as a family and as a team, what, what, how do we approach these things uh, as, as best we can. So I'm gonna show a tiny little video of uh, what has taken place this year and then we'll start on our tour. biggest deal of its kind in history. This is an unbelievable opportunity for conservation and for Chile. Doug and I have, if you look back at the trajectory of our lives, have been very consistent. We, as, as Eric said, I was brought up on the ranch of my great-grandparents in California, and Doug also was raised on a farm in uh, north of New York City. And we had, for a lot of reasons, these sort of innate wild streaks in us, and we were climbers and boaters, and uh, we were both ski racers, and this kind of frame of mind toward nature and, and, and loving wildness started at a, at a very early age. And I don't know why this is not clicking forward. There we go. We were also brought up in the 60s, like some of you at least, where we were uh, in the middle or on the outskirts of a lot of different movements, the peace movement, the feminist movement, of course, uh, civil rights, which I just missed uh, mostly, I was too young, but all of these movements that we were exposed to, even though we were really small, informed what we, and I think many of us, would become later on. You fight for the things that you disagree with. You fight for things that you love. And that's how we got started. And these ethics were born out of the companies that we eventually were so involved in. Doug was the founder of the North Face, eventually sold that. And with Susie, his former wife, they began the fashion company called Esprit. And um, as was mentioned, I met Yvonne uh, when I was 15. I didn't start working for him when I was 15. <laughs> That would be child labor issues. <laughs> but I did start working for him uh, during my college summers, and then when I graduated from college, like anyone in the early 70s, who knew what we were supposed to do once we actually finished college, I went back and I started working with him and did so for a very long time and ended up uh, creating Patagonia with him, and, and uh, that was my one big job. 
by the time I was 40 and by the time Doug was nearly 50, though we loved the companies that we had been so central to and that were central to us, it wasn't enough. I f we felt like we were sitting on the sidelines of something that was about to pass us by. And for us, that meant the, what was happening to wild nature. We grew up in the national park system in the United States, which is, of course, one of the emblematic heartbeats of the world today. We're protecting those masterpieces in, 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 in all countries. So we decided to leave our business lives, and in my case, in 1993, and Doug a couple years earlier, and start thinking about the creation of a family foundation to address the problems that we felt were insidious throughout the planet. And that, of course, is the great um, species extinction crisis, which some of you here probably study, or you know a lot more about the specifics than I do. The, obviously, the issue of climate change, the degradation of soils through erosion and toxicity through, through agricultural practices since, since World War II. All of these things, especially in the last 200 years, have added up to uh, a collapse, in most cases, of ecosystems. And I know this is not a very popular conversation, but, but that is what motivated us to what shall we do? with these problems. And our response to this has been the following areas. The, con the permanent conservation of territory, and I'm talking about landscapes at this point, and we chose to use the strategy of creating national parks because where we work in Chile and Argentina, the, the greatest institutional protection for land is a national park status, as it is here in the United States. And of course, these things can be tested. And in the current administration here, we find ourselves at least worrying about the efficacy of, of that level of protection. But still in all, there you have it. So national parks are a strategy for us. Marine national parks, which we started just in the last few years. These happen to be down by the Beagle Channel. These are immense areas. Uh, actually, the director of these projects is sitting here in the front row. Uh, also, same thing, no take, give it a rest. This is how we, uh, so conservation, restoration of landscape, and in many cases, that is taking the livestock off and just, as I said, give it a rest. There are more complicated and complex strategies that you have to use, but when you're working in large landscapes, um, often that's what's required. Restoration. <laughs> Restoration of seascapes, but again, that has a lot to do with marine conservation territories. Are the nurseries protected? Are, are the migratory lanes for marine life protected? Those kinds of questions come into view. Another one of our pillars, rewilding. I don't know how many of you have um, really become comfortable with this term, but this is really bringing back extirpated species to an area, wherever it is. And in some cases, it can be through translocation, which you see a lot of in, in moving 300 elephants this last year from South Africa up into Botswana. There are lots of experience in Africa. But one of the things that we have begun 10 years ago was rewilding without translocation, really bringing in um, individuals, whether they're jaguars and so on, and building populations from scratch. But we're gonna talk about that. But this is a big part of our work. 
Regenerative ag, I don't know how many of you are involved in issues of agriculture. I'm not going to talk about it very much tonight, but I will say this, as my husband Doug always said, if you don't get agriculture right, you can kiss the rest goodbye. So as we talk a lot about 2030 and looking at 30% of the land uh, uh, of the Earth's surface in conservation and maybe 50% by 2050, the big conundrum, in my opinion, is what do you do with agriculture and how do you move that oil tanker that fast? I think it will be the big challenge for us going forward. But enough about that quite sure. And activism, I, I, I won't say much about this, but this is a huge part of what we do. We believe in the quote from, from Edward Abbey, that sentiment without action is the ruin of the soul. So unlike a lot of conservation groups, and I'm every each to his own, we do get in fights. We do um, sit and sit in front of the heavy operators, heavy equipment operators and so on, whatever it takes. And I'll show you a, an example or two of this as I go on. And then finally, human communities, dignified, local. I think that we would all agree that unless you have local communities who feel a part of and benefit from national parks, or any sort of conservation effort, you will, if you're trying to work in terms of 100 to 200 years out there, you ha may lose your first line of defense, which is always local communities next door to any park or any project. So, 1993, Doug and I go south. We have our, we have our foundation figured out. We know the areas that we think we can make an impact on and here we go. And this is where I, I retired on a, on a Friday and two days later, we ended up here in a roadless area in the south of Chile at the toe of a fjord. And that became our base for what just became Pumalin Douglas Tompkins National Park. And so this is how we got started. Since, we, since then, we have been fortunate enough to have created 13 new national parks, putting just over 13 million acres of territory into permanent protection. And that's what the map looks like. So there's a little, a little, some stats. Uh, I just told you about the 13 and 13 plus and working on 12 species to bring them back so that they will flourish once again in their rightful places. Obviously, um, climate change is on everybody's mind, and we have very recently begun to talk about what are the impacts of our work on um, carbon mitigation, climate change in general. And, and uh, we've been very shy about that, actually. And we're just now starting to enter those conversations with, with a lot of people outside our team. So now I'm going to take you on a little tour. Remember, it's three areas, starting in Chile, Pumalin, uh, Douglas Tompkins National Park, signed in the 28th of February in 2018, just over a million acres, and off we go. This, you can see, it's just below Puerto Montt, and it goes from the border of Argentina with Chile and the top of the Andes all the way through 800,000 acres of pristine temperate rainforest. So think about southern New Zealand, or think about the coast of B British Columbia, and all the way down to the Pacific Ocean. This is the first project that we ever um, undertook, and this is where all hell broke loose in, in early 90s. We were known as the couple who cut Chile in half. We were accused of creating a new Jewish state, even though we had been raised as Anglicans, 
we were accused of creating uh, a nuclear waste dump for the United States or a refueling stage for the Argentine government to come in and finish Chile off once and for all. But those things, when we look at them now, they seem almost humorous in, in the ridiculousness of them. But in those days, imagine two foreigners coming to southern Chile, buying up large tracts of land and doing nothing with it. I always said to Doug, as the, you know, naval planes are coming flying over our house and they wanted to throw Doug out of the country, I said, let's cut a few trees. We'll behave like everyone else and things will be fine. <laughs> But it, it took a few years to just stick sort of shoulder to the grindstone, creating public infrastructure for the park, inviting the public in. And today we have uh, thousands of people visiting the park. And we had 12,000 people camping there last season. And, and that's just the evolution of shock and awe <laughs> into, of course, of course it's a national park. It's a masterpiece of the country. So I'll just show you a few things. These are, I don't know how many botanists are in the, in the audience tonight, but these are the cousins of the giant sequoias. These are the alerce trees. And Pumaline has about a quarter of the, of the, of the remaining alerces in the world. And uh, it's a very interesting forest, uh, a lot of science has taken place in this area. Um, waterfalls, pristine, absolutely pure water systems. And it doesn't seem that I can get very far from this computer. My clicker doesn't work. So these are just some general photographs. But besides, besides the, the value of Pumaline as, um, from a scientific point of view, it is one of the great beauties found anywhere. And it is just over a million acres of pristine territory. So I always have to remind myself that no matter what happens in 200 years, if this million acres is still there, and the, and the lodge is fallen to the ground, or who knows what can happen. But if, if that park can maintain itself as a petri dish for the future, we will have achieved what we would hope to achieve. Architecture is very important to us in all of our parks, and the style is always um, determined by what the local architectural um, iconography is, and this is what you'll find in Pumaline Park. So I won't, I won't spend much time on this, but it gives you an idea of the infrastructure that's there and the kind of things that visitors who, who may 25 years ago have, have been very suspicious about what all this was. Today it is beloved and really a sense of ownership by the Chilean public. OK. This, now we're going to move south, about 400 miles south from there, to the brand new, as of January of this year, Patagonia National Park, 764,000 acres, <clears throat> largely Patagonia steppe grassland. And here you see uh, it's, again, right between the Pacific Ocean and Argentina. It runs all the way to the Argentine border, and I'll show you a few photographs. On to the west, it goes from the ice cap, the Pacific Ocean, the ice cap, across the Baca River, which is the largest flowing river in the country, through um, a transverse valley that is very unusual, and the one of the glories of this particular place and why it became so important to us, and one of the reasons, is that it has water systems that are very rare in the, in the southern cone, in the Patagonia region. It has lakes and 
rivers and streams and lagoons, and um, this allowed for an ecosystem that was very unique. So that's why we went after it. The, the main purchase was one ranch. It was the largest ranch in, uh, the third largest ranch in Chile. And when we arrived, the grasslands were down to the ground. In many places, the structure of the grass was gone. And in the most, <clears throat> the vast part of the park today, 14 years later, this is what the grasslands are beginning to look like. Will they, we don't know what, what these, these grasslands look like, really. I've been trying to figure out, even in Darwin's time, when he visited the Patagonia region, what did he find? What did, what did the grasslands really look like? How tall were they? How, 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 how abundant were they? But it's very hard, just like the grasslands of the United States, it's very hard to find original examples and how to get back to that. As I said, this park goes all the way up to the border so you saw the photograph of the ice cap, and this is the border. This is looking out into Argentina, and we have a project going right on the other side of the border, 1.2 million acres, to co-join with this one, hopefully someday, to see a 2 million acre um, national park, uh, two national parks, one on each side of the border. I have to say that or I get in trouble. But ecologically, you have the ice cap to forest, you have grasslands, you have semi-arid and on out into the arid territory of Argentina. And that is really, um, that's something to shoot for. So Magic Lenick, um Woodpeckers, just I thought I would show you a few photographs of the wildlife there. Some of them are very common to you, no doubt, but some of them may be, may be somewhat new. This guy, kind of small, not very exciting, but was nearly extinct in this, in this region. And he's back, fluffy, being blown around in the Patagonian winds, and we're very proud of these guys. They've, they've really made a comeback. Pumas. This is a big part of our story, as in the United States or wherever predators are found, you find conflict, and, and the population of pumas and foxes in this area have been, have been hammered for the last century as, as livestock came in and became the number one economic driver for this area. Here's one of his um, uh, neighbors. Since we purchased the first 200,000 acres of this project, we stopped the killing of pumas and foxes, and now we have a, what I would call very healthy, um, I won't say too healthy, but they're getting awfully friendly, uh, pumas in this park. And on the negative side, if you ask one of the park's neighbors who's still working in livestock, they'll, they call us the Puma factory and not congrat in a congrat congratulatory way. So there are all these conflicts. Of course, wherever you're working, you have these conflicts between, between production and conservation, and this is no exception. Hello. Well, I'll just show you a few things. The Andean condor, I think most of you have seen them or photographs of them, and, and we are working on a project to make sure we see more of them as the years go by. This is one of the young pumas taken within our puma project. Um, cute as a button. Just some shots of these. I wanted to tell a story about an inherent conflict that takes place in conservation and one of the conundrums that we've struggled with over the years. This deer, I know, doesn't look like much. It's a mule deer by <laughs> visually, 
but it's called the Waymul deer, and there are only 1,700 of them left in the world. And this project has probably 15% of the standing population that's left and was one of the reasons that we decided to get involved in this territory in the first place. So what happens? We have a charge to try to participate in, in at least establishing a, a fixed or a steady population, and with any luck, we see it rise a bit. But as we begin, to stop the killing of pumas and foxes, we find ourselves committed to one species, trying to see that it flourishes. And in fact, at the management of pumas became a real issue. We could be finishing off the last deer by virtue of bringing the predators back. So this set us off on a trail of puma monitoring, uh, waymool deer, management and so on that's gone on for 10 years. So I just bring this up. This is another species we're working with in this park. Um, there were a few there, not enough, and we're working to bring the numbers up. Uh, this is a juvenile condor. This is his first flight in three. This is it. This is his maiden voyage just before he takes off. It looks like he's crowing, and he was sort of crowing. He sounded sort of like a chicken. But off he went, and we know exactly where he's been since then and the territory that he's covering. This is a very rare cat, and this is a, a, a very poor photograph of a very rare cat. <laughs> so this is just to say that in all these conservation projects, you get involved in things. Once you've signed the check to buy the land, then things get really interesting. And that has happened to us in virtually all 35 projects that we've run. This is the, just uh, briefly, this is the architecture here. It harkens back to <clears throat> the old English architecture of, of Patagonia. Uh, we have trails now out into the grasslands, up into the high areas, and lots of people coming to visit this new park. So we're very proud about that. I mentioned activism when I first started talking to you. And this is one of the big emblematic fights that we got in. I told you about the Bakker River, the largest volume river in the country, which they were going to put four dams on. And that kicked off a fight that probably some of you have heard about. It went on eight years. We spent millions of dollars on it. But it was one of the great emblematic turning points in Chilean society since the dictatorship ended. Because it wasn't just the Tompkins fighting this river. There were 100,000 Chileans in one night marching in the streets of Santiago, even though they'd never been to Patagonia, and many of them never will. But they. It was David and Goliath from the first day, and in this case, David won. <laughs> that river is running free, and, and there will be no dams on that river. So just a, an example of, of conservation, of <laughs> activism. <clears throat> so this is the last place I want to show you. It is um, wetlands. And now you go all the way up into northern Argentina to the province of Corrientes, to the, what is now the Ibarra National Park, 1.7 million acres. This is what it looks like uh, the first time that Doug and I landed there on an island in a small plane. Uh, somebody was hoping we would get involved in trying to conserve this area. And I got out of the plane and said, no. <laughs> It's hot, bugs, <laughs> flat, zero interest. I'm a coastal girl or mountains. Let's get out of here as fast as possible. Doug, on the other hand, saw something and said, well, wait a second, Bertie. This could be interesting. No, it's not interesting. Let's just get out of here. So he went back to Argentina a month later, and he bought it behind my back. He bought the first 150,000 acres. And, and, and I hate to say this, 
but he was so right. <laughs> and we've been there since 1997, and have the most extraordinary team, much like the US team and the Chilean team, biologists, people from, from all over have come to work with us on this project. It really has, this is the center, this is our base, it's called Rincon del Socorro. Um, people come and stay there, people come and work there. So this is the base of the operation for many years. And I just wanted to show you some photographs. There are nearly 400 species of birds, and most of them are in good shape. But some of them are not, and we're working on them. And I'll show you some of this. This is my favorite bird, this uh, roseated spoonbill. This guy is nearly extinct, but in this one area, he's doing very well. So we're very cautious about that. We know where their populations are. We don't let many people in there. We're, we're trying very hard to see that this one um, comes back. Species who were there, and, and um, you think of marsh deer in, in 1.7 million acres of marshland would be secure, but there were very few. I don't know if most of you know who Dr. George Schaller is. He's one of the great natural uh, field biologists of, all, of, of our generation. He visited here in 1976 and saw very few. So as he comes and visits us from time to time now, he's very pleased about this particular species. And this is a, carp, a capybara, the large, world's largest rodent. <laughs> and what's wrong with him? There are too many of him. Because there are no predators, these guys who reproduce very quickly have run havoc. We love them, but it's a mess. But I'll get back to that. Howler monkeys, extraordinary flora throughout this territory. Okay, so who's missing? They're missing. They've been missing since the 1930s. They were missing, were missing, since the 1930s. Today we have 200, I guess a little over 200 individuals who are in the wild, three different populations, and reproducing some of them for their fourth time since they were reintroduced. This is officially back, the giant anteater. Who else is doing well? Pampas deer? It's not that they're extinct from Argentina, but they certainly were extinct from this ecosystem, and their numbers are quite low. They, there used to be millions of them in the country, and today they're down to around 2,500 indi individuals, so in deep trouble. So now they're back. We have two functioning populations of pampas deer. These guys, <clears throat> tapirs, adorable, very high on the adorable chart. They've been gone for decades and decades, and now they're back very slowly. They reproduce very slowly. But we have uh, probably 12 individuals. We've had three young, and we have several tapirs coming in to go through our quarantine system and then are released to find their way into the wild again. Oopsie, that's not good. Hmm. Maned wolf, rare species, very um, tentative in terms of, of its its health and the ecosystem. Uh, we have done some work with these, but mostly we're just trying to protect their territory so they, they um, survive. Okay, so these, nobody really likes dealing with these guys. They're white-collared peccaries, and they're really mean. We've had more trouble with the peccaries that we've brought in than any other species, and they're easy to reproduce. You can get as many as a dozen of them, go through quarantine, let them go with their little collars on, and off they go. But you do have to stay, stay clear of them. They're, 
they have a bad, uh, bad humor. <laughs> this is a project that I think for all of us on our team is, is one of the most dear. It is the green-winged macaw, missing from not only Iberá, but from Argentina for the last 100 to 125 years. And when our team asked me about trying to bring them back, I was completely against it. I just felt like it was such a long shot. But I'll skip over a very long arc of a story and tell you that there are eight flying free, doesn't sound like a big number, but it's a start. And Louie is going to London in a week or so because we're being gifted 20 other individuals who will fly from London to Ibera and enter the training program to be released. So we have eight in the wild. We have eight sort of on deck. I guess that's a baseball term. <laughs> and, and others who are coming on. So this is, for us, this is a real charge. And I just have a few photographs before I leave to show you what it takes to bring these species back. This is, we get a lot of baby anteaters who are, who are just born. And my husband always thought I was, was a nasty little personality. But these guys, you have to hold them. They don't like to be put down. You have to feed them every hour or so. And, and they crawl down your shirt because they like to be hidden. And here, uh, bringing a deer back. Here's a little juvenile getting ready to have its collar put on and eventually be let go. Here's one of the macaws having his toenails clipped and a, a general checkup. This is the work of the gods, I tell you. <laughs> and one of our <clears throat> breeding jaguars who is having a physical on-site at the jaguar breeding center that we have been running for about five years. I'm very happy to say that we have the largest rewilding program in all the Americas. There's not really anything else like this, and we, because of that, have a lot of visitors. We do, we share every piece of information we have, whether it was a failure or a success. So we're very proud of this, um, being able to play a role in, in the expansion of this concept called rewilding. And then, of course, once everybody's gone, they're tracked until we understand that they're well, that, they're, that the, the threats, of course, are down. And, and uh, I won't get into this. This is another activism. These are our team members having rented Argentine military uniforms. <laughs> and we won this battle, too, but not in the way you might think. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to know they, they have a great creativity when it comes to activism. So I'll leave you with this. Lots of people ask us, um, why do we get involved in all these things? And, and like I'm sure many of you, some of it's from just a very intimate identification with wild things, wind and the eyes of a jaguar and whatever else we feel when we're out. Um, we escape our urban lives. But we also stay so focused on the biodiversity crisis, what's happening with climate change, the people who believe that Mostly everything's okay. We, we worry about the globalized economy. We worry about technology and how it use, is used to, to accelerate the conversion of nat the natural world to production. And all those things drive what we do. But sometimes it just comes back to these guys. And uh, <laughs> we do have two baby jaguars. They're not so baby now. But I was in Africa when I got the news that they'd been born. And you would have thought that we'd hit the 
reached the moon again or gone to Mars, for, for us and for so many people actually around the world, these little baby jaguars were quite emblematic. So, so we do work for them. <laughs> Kit foxes, of course, um, our daughters, our daughters' daughters, our daughters' sons, and all all future generations, as, as Jane says, as Jane Goodall says, we are stealing the future of our children and our children's children today. And that ought to be something that drives all of us. So, and I speak, of course, on behalf of my husband, and he really was, is, the visionary for so much of this work and so I carry him in my heart every day at this work and uh, anyway I thank you very much. <laughs> So, Christine, thank you for that wonderful uh, lecture and for the wonderful work that you do. Uh, we now have uh, some time uh, for some questions, and there are microphones, I think, on either side of the room. So, people who have questions, please. Christine. I hear you anyway. <laughs> learned, ah, there we go, any lessons learned from that fight for those of us that are working here in this country now to protect our national monuments, to say, no, we shouldn't be drilling in the Arctic, we shouldn't be logging our forests. Um, any advice for us? I, I think there are a lot of things to be learned, and, and it really, I don't know if this is helpful, but I can tell you that every community comes at you or you enter into their lives from a different angle. In the Patagonia region, it's grasslands, therefore it's sheep and cattle, therefore it's ranchers, and you're, you're, you're entering in at a time when ranching, as it is in most places, unless it's at an industrial scale, is collapsing. So you can be blamed for a lot of things that, that frankly, you had nothing to do with. In northern Argentina, different kinds of circumstances. I, I think a mistake that we made in the beginning is we were talking to the national government about these projects. But we didn't start locally and then go to national governments. And I, I see now that was one of the mistakes we made and have tried to correct since then because in my whole heart, if you do not get individuals in the communities around you, even if you're successful in this period of time, you, you knock back the percentage of your possibility for success so greatly if you don't do that. And anyway, everybody wants to be a good neighbor. That's how we were brought up. So you don't want those kinds of issues. So the sense of ownership at a local level is really essential. Thank you. Yep. Oh. You may have already answered my question. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV, and it's amazing the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it takes so many hundreds and thousands of people to do this. So as you extrapolate. I hope not. <laughs> Sorry, that was a joke. Uh, it's all right. As you extrapolate this and you're you're talking about the local communities being very much involved. And then how do you take that so where you have a mass of the people, even in the urban areas, because we're rapidly urbanizing as, as a globe, 
mm. and connect them to what it is that you're doing because a lot of people are not going to be able to travel there but yet still are critical to support you and be a part of this whole process. So how do you do that as well as work with local uh, state or regional governments, not only just the national mm. governments to be involved in this? So it's a very comprehensive effort and outreach that you're doing and thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. I, th I find that a, it's a good question and a difficult one to answer because we don't want to assume that people aren't going to get to their national parks. I, I don't want to assume that because that is one of the big pushes on in many countries and I know in the United States, find your park, there are these big campaigns. There, we do a lot of media. We do a lot of um, wringing of our hands over this question, to tell you the truth. Because it's actually a much bigger problem, of course, as you know. It, urban people are every year farther afield from the very things that sustain them. And I'm talking about kids for the most part. Their little beautiful faces are stuffed in a telephone or they're stuffed in an iPad or whatever it is. And, and the criteria or the priority to make sure that kids are out in nature and understanding the basis of all life is, I don't know if it's in an all-time low, but it's low. I think that's not a problem that we can solve. I think it's a societal problem in probably most countries. And I don't really have a good answer for it. We do what we can as a, as a foundation. We are very, very present in Chile and Argentina in the conversation about the importance of biodiversity, what's happening with climate change, and all those problems that we see. But to be honest, the old adage of you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I, we have worked a quarter of a century trying to remind people, to, to inspire them, to, you know, <laughs> in so many ways, trying to encourage more people to be either connected or reconnected to these issues, to these places, fall in love again, whatever it is, and it's very difficult. I think, I think media tries. I think good old David Attenborough, honestly, sometimes I think if it weren't for Mr. Attenborough, I don't know where we'd be, because he truly is the voice for wild nature, wild systems. This guy eats this guy, and so on and so forth. But where is the priority in civil society? That's the problem. There is not a priority in, in, in civil society to protect the masterpieces of the place, protect the watersheds, with the exception of, there are a few exceptions, Bogota, Colombia, New York City, they save the forest for their water systems. But it, it's, a, it's a sea change that has to take place. It starts with leadership and, and natural systems in their full form, are so underappreciated and underrepresented in terms of conversations between leadership. We met with Pope Francis the end of June, a private conversation in his library at the Vatican. What did he want to talk about? He wants to talk about that. I had a list of things I wanted to talk to him about, and one of them was, Your Holiness, if we don't save and restore natural ecosystems, your work in, in creating dignified and healthy human systems is not going to work. But he's one of the few leaders who speaks out about that. So I see the problem not just laterally in Chile or in Argentina, but it is a, it is a crisis that is void of leadership in general. Hi, uh, my name is Matt Jacobson. I work with Mighty Earth here in Washington, D.C., and I've been working for the past 
25 or so years <laughs> dedicating my life to the protection of yeah. the last wild place on Earth. And um, I wanted to briefly call attention to another aspect of your and Doug's legacy. I said I've been working on this for 25 years. And uh, 25 years ago, in order to do this work, uh, I had to work as a waiter uh, to pay for my bills while I was working full time as an activist. Um, since that time, I've gone on to be involved, I had the honor of being involved in, uh, in a small part of projects that have protected hundreds of millions of acres throughout wow. the United States. But 25 years ago, while I was working as a waiter, I got my, my first uh, grant from a foundation. Oh. Uh, was from the Irahidi, which became uh, yes. Foundation for Deep Ecology of Dogs, and from Nice Pat to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> and from you Patagonia. and I look a lot different than we did 25 <laughs> <know>. years ago. <laughs> and from Patagonia. And okay. uh, was my was my second grant, and uh, it allowed me to stop working a night job and dedicate my whole life to working to protect the earth. And there's a whole generation of us out there who got our first boost up from you guys. And on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you for that. Oh my goodness! Thank you. Really, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, hi, my name is Florencia. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, I'm from Chile, so this is especially ah, touching for me. Um, and I wanted to ask you, you already discussed this a little, but how do you plan to stay engaged with the Chilean government and to make sure that the area is protected even with the change in the political vision or government of the moment? Always a good question, and usually the first question we get, so I was surprised uh, it didn't come up, number one. It's always a question mark when you decide to make these big donations, what will happen, as I said earlier, 100 to 200 years from now? And you can't control that as much as I would like to control everything. There are a lot of things you can't control. You do your best in the moment that you're present and, and calling that shot. The, the donation agreements we, we sign with the government both in both countries, states that if the lands that we donate are ever used for anything outside of the original intent and spirit of the donation, we would take it back. Now, again, that's not an argument you want to get into, but if you had to, you have the legal foundation to do so. But really, it's, it's uh, creating Ruta de los Parques, a, a, a system we now have that we created after this last large donation to connect up the 17 national parks in southern Chile, 2,800 kilometers long, with 60 communities in it. So you, you have to work along with governments to create the atmosphere. So regardless of what governments come and go, that, that society, that, that, that the system, even the economic system in the south, is driven and benefits from the health and longevity of these places. So it's never just one thing. It's a lot of things bundled together. And you have to have faith in the countries you're working in, which we do. Yeah. OK, let's, let's go to this side for another question. Hi. Uh, many of us here, and especially I think people from other countries, have thought, well, that's great what you've done there what would it take to do that in my country? And uh, the process that you've described is one that leads from a private donation and private impetus, mm. ultimately to a national park. And national parks are run by governments. Yes. That costs money. Yes. So what are we talking about if we wanted to do something like this if there were activists and i'm sure there are in morocco or indonesia or even pakistan to create a park and then operate it and protect it from mm. those who would good question who would hurt it what are you finding yeah. from your operating experience there in chile and argentina that that people need to be thinking of when they talk to government officials mm. In terms of cost. I think any government, even my own family probably, would run the parks the way we have. A very, you know, a little OCD, <laughs> cutting the grass with toenail clippers and so on. So, so you have to factor in what's the value system? What do you come back to? 
And as I said about Pumalin, in 100 or 200 years, if there are no buildings left, even though that is not what we want, but at the heart of it, why do we create national parks? They are a strategy towards something larger. And what is that? It's the biodiversity crisis. You are creating canvases where biological evolution can take place. I, th I think it's just part of the work. There are, there are examples. African parks in, 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 in Africa is probably the best example I know of. If somebody really wants to think about how to manage parks that may be non-governmental 100%, but they are national parks, everybody should look up African parks and read about their work. I truly think it's a model that will go much um, to a much broader base than the countries they currently work in. Thank you. We have time for just two more questions. Let's finish with this one, but one more. Uh, I'm a retired lawyer who worked a lot in Latin America. One of the questions I have in, I've worked in Argentina and Chile, is how were you able to acquire so much land from private owners? Is there was, there's been a problem in, in Latin America over the years in getting land from latifundistas, is a Spanish word. Um, and uh, it's hard to imagine that some of the things you talk about, that, is it the government that purchased this land from private owners? Or was it just no, we, government? No, we as a family foundation, a, a key word in our work is leverage. <laughs> yeah. Always. We as a family foundation have purchased on just on the conservation side, not the agricultural side, about 2.5 million acres, just straight up from other private owners. From ranchers? From anybody. Everybody. And the government, there have been no political problems in Argentina? On no, the I would. Or in Chile? Uh, uh, well, I, I described some of the, we had terrible political problems in the beginning, as I mentioned. But that, that's not the government saying you can't do that or you have to have that kind, uh, you have to have a kind of a government approval before you buy, before there's a transaction between two private parties. No. In, Chile, in Argentina, for the first 15 years we were there, we had the same standards of, of negotiation and purchase as I just described for Chile. But probably 10 years ago, they, uh, especially for ag land, and it went region by region, there was a topping 1,000 hectares, 2,500 acres, that a foreigner could buy of productive land. So they topped it out. And there are several countries who do that. But that's largely focused on, on productive land. So it's a transaction between two private, a buyer and a seller, especially in Chile. No, it's I, possible. I, just, I don't know what else to say. I just have one other. <laughs> you look dumbfounded. Let's, 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 we have to, we sort of have to yeah, move on. Yeah, one so. other comment, and that is that Latin America is going through a transition now. There are problems in Peru, Ecuador, and in, in, in Central America, in, in um, Nicaragua, and in, and in Venezuela. And so I don't know what we're going to see in terms of the United States relationship with the, the rest of Latin America. I don't know how healthy that's going to be. Thank you. All right. Thank I'll you. Just, thank you. just one tiny comment to that. I, th I think you maybe are grouping too many countries into that classification. Um, Chile, Argentina, Peru, Colombia, those have very good relationships with the United States. Venezuela, we all know, is blowing up and it's just taking longer than it should. And, and of course, Central America has its own set of complications in terms of their relationships with the U.S. But, but Uruguay, their, their, their relationships, they're not very unstable. Argentina, in terms of its, its political class or, or the economy, is is 
a roller coaster, but let me tell you, they're a country who, and you get in underneath that layer, and they're steady, they're reliable, and my our experience in Argentina has been 98% positive. So I think you have to look at these countries. First of all, they're always evolving in their and whether it's the relationship with the U.S. or, or otherwise, and uh, always going back and taking a look at them for their current state. Thank you very Thank much, you. everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine, again. A wonderful, a wonderful talk. And... Uh, We'll look forward to following you in the, in the coming decades. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, everyone. I do want to, before you all leave, I want to announce one thing you'll see out in the front. Uh, we have an exciting program coming up in the near future. Uh, Walter Isaacson, you may know him from his authorship of, of the book on Steve Jobs and Einstein and others, is going to be on stage here on November 15th, the evening of November 15th, uh, interviewing Eric Schmidt, who you may recognize the name, who started the company Google. So we'd welcome you back for that uh, great lecture as well. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you again soon.